In the last hundred years, much has happened to Canada and to Canadians. For each of us, the story is different. This is one. Johnny Jones was born somewhere in the Yukon bush during the Klondike gold rush at the end of the last century. He lived in two societies, the Klinglet Indian to which he belonged and the white which often surrounded him. He learned to balance the two. He grew up to make his mark on the Yukon and the Yukon a mark in the world. In 1910, Johnny and two younger sisters went to the Chutlak Mission School near Carcross in the Yukon. Yeah, I went to mission school 24 months in, in four years. And I learned uh, about Santa Claus and Christmas <laughs> and all of that. And he decided he'd make Christmas for his family for the first time. As usual that fall, the Johns family was living, hunting and trapping in the bush. Their home was a small canvas tent under Grey Mountain. The missionaries taught that the joy of Christmas came from giving presents to the people that you love. So Johnny needed to figure out how to make money to buy gifts. He was too small to shoot a moose and haul it out of the bush by himself. So he hunted blue grouse. Oh, I could uh, sell it be grouse, blue grouse, you know. Angela Sidney still remembers that first Christmas. My brother Johnny hunts blue grouse on the Grey Mountain. The big grouse, you know. You ever seen that? Blue grouse. Christmas had to be a surprise, so Johnny shot the grouse, hid them in the woods, and waited. He waited for his father to send him to town for groceries. Then he picked up his grouse, loaded the sled, and drove the dog team to Carcross. At Watson's store, Matthew Watson paid Johnny 50 cents a grouse. Yeah, I made $60, around $60, I remember that. So the, in those days, the $60 was quite a bit of money, you see, so I spent it all for Christmas thing, you see. He ordered his presents from the Eaton's catalog. That wasn't very easy to do as a 12-year-old, was it? Uh, no, no, I really had to figure it out, you know, send out for the stuff to eat, to eat and catalog, you know, not Winnipeg, <laughs> those days. He got the pair of socks, German socks, they call it, from my father, and the pair of stockings from my mother, and me too, and the boys, something for them. When the presents arrived from Winnipeg, Johnny took his dogs back to Carcross to pick them up. To make the Christmas feast, Johnny asked his 10-year-old sister, Angela, for help. He asked me, if you can cook some kind of cake, we can make some kind of Christmas dinner, you know? Well, I tell him, well, the only thing we could have is molasses, a damn molasses cake. How would that be? Oh, that sounds good, he said. That's good enough. So I cooked that. While Angela cooked the cake, Johnny went to cut a Christmas tree. To keep the surprise, Johnny hung a sheet down the middle of the tent and sent his sister and brothers to bed behind it while he finished getting ready. But there were holes in the sheet, so Angela and her brothers peeked. And every time we do something funny, we laugh, giggle, me and my two brothers. When the children woke up on Christmas Day, Johnny asked them, did you see what Santa Claus brought you? Yeah, we saw him bringing in the tree and everything. The mission school, which taught about Santa Claus and giving presents, also taught Johnny and Angela that God created the earth. That wasn't what their parents believed. Oh, the Indian people, they think Raven is the one that made the world. But I know my brother and my father used to argue about it. My 
My, my father used to survive and make the world. My, my brother too, no, God made the world. And he used to argue and argue about it all the time. Every now and then. Well, I guess they, my brother wants to tease my daddy, that's all. Now. Yeah, I guess so. I, I can't remember all the little things. Yeah. <laughs> did you argue for, to be ornery or did you argue because you believed it? I don't remember at all. <laughs> I, I don't remember that part. What did you think? I think that was too crazy to think anything. <laughs> Until the 1970s, Indians were not allowed to attend public schools unless they agreed to give up their Indian rights. First the British and then the Canadian governments paid Christian churches to set up segregated schools for native children. Catholic, Baptist and Anglican missionaries eagerly did so. The Chutla boarding school had been founded by Bishop Bompas of the Anglican Church at the end of the 19th century. The missionaries wanted the Indian children to learn European manners dress and skills. So Johnny and the boys were taught carpentry and farming. And Angela and the girls learned cooking, gardening, and sewing. The missionaries thought they were rescuing the children from their primitive family environments. They set about civilizing the children and teaching them Christianity. They introduced the children to prayer, but Indian people already knew about prayer. Mother, mother learned how to pray long before white man came. They had their ways, you know. When they arrived at school, the children had their clothes and moccasins removed and replaced with European clothes. Their heads were washed and shaved, even if they didn't have lice. Thin, weak soup and white bread replaced their normal diet of fresh meat, berries, and fish. Well, <clears throat> how are you talking about it? It was just no good. <laughs> the manager, he did things that uh, a drunk on the streets wouldn't do, you know what I mean? I'd eat turkey and chicken before you and the kids out on. Starving to death. Most of the kids that went to that school, uh, <coughs> all, all developed TB, all died off. Just a few uh, survived. Johnny and his sisters were luckier than many children because their family lived nearby. But we got along pretty good because we always come home Saturday, you see. And uh, so that way we got a lot of good food, you know, nourishing food. My father took us out in the year 1912, and sometime in May. I just stayed in school just one year, that's all. Johnny and Angela's eight-year-old sister died of appendicitis at the Jutlock Mission School. He took us out because my sister died there, and he blamed the school for it. Many children died at Jutlak. Molly Dixon died of cholera, 1907. Baby George, an orphan, died of TB. One old tin cup hanging in the corridor to drink water out of everybody. And some of these kids are TB and... Kitty Atlin. Bella Daniels. Elizabeth Wadlaki. Tony and Eva Dow. There were many. The folks uh, took us out. Most parents didn't take their children out of school because they were afraid. If parents did protest the care of their children and refused to send them back, the government ordered the Mounties to take the children away from their families.
When they arrived at the mission schools, most of the children spoke only their Indian languages. Dora Wedge is 17 years younger than her brother Johnny. As a teenager, she spent three years at Chutla. Were you allowed to speak your language in school? No, we couldn't. When we went to school, we couldn't speak our own language. Otherwise, we'd get strapping. Dora's daughter, Annie, also went to Chutla for a couple of years while her mother was out on the trap lines. Things hadn't changed much. I wasn't allowed to speak, so now, as a result, I can understand, but I can't uh, speak it. We get the strap, you know, so therefore you had to really, really make sure that you didn't. But nowadays, our language is gone. I used to love listening to my grandmother telling stories. Later on, there was words there that I couldn't really understand. We uh, think it around here, they, they don't understand it. They can speak French better than they can speak their own Tlingit language. Johnny John's children also had to go to Chutlak. And my daughter had her help was going, so the doctor said, under oh, no, nurse, and had many fights with the principal over uh, that time over my daughter. And the natives couldn't go to public school then. Johnny's legal options were limited. The Canadian government decided that if an Indian wanted to go to university or open a business, join the army, or send his children to public school, he could, but only if he gave up his native rights. That was their deal. So Johnny took his daughter out of Chutla and lost his Indian rights. But I had to do that to get my kids to public school, see? They told me that, but I lost my Indian rights. But finally now, a year or so now, we've got our, our rights back. Indians hoped that their children would have a better chance if they had the white man's education. But the price was high. The children paid with the loss of their lives, their languages, their hunting and trapping skills, their culture, their names, and respect. In the 1960s and 70s, the Canadian government changed part of its policy of forced assimilation of native people and closed the mission schools. Chutla School stands trash today, a symbol of the anger and bitterness that the Indian people never openly expressed before. Because Johnny and Angela spent such a short time at school, they've managed to keep their identity. Angela Sidney never lost her Indian languages, and in 1986, won the Order of Canada for her contributions in saving Indian languages and culture. Who gave you the award? The government, what do you call it? That woman? What's her name now? She, she. Jean Sauvé? Huh? Jean Sauvé? Sauvé? I don't know. I guess so. It's a woman. Uh, when, when I went down there to, to, to get my pin, my, my shoelace untied. I didn't know it. Here she bent down and tied my shoelace up. <laughs> After Johnny John's 24 months of school, he went home to continue doing what his family had always done, hunting, trapping, and fishing. About the same time, Johnny's father had an accident, breaking his hip in a snow slide. There were no doctors to fix it. I trapped since I was uh, pretty young, knee-high, uh, they say. I, I did it on my own, uh, 13 years on, because my father was old. By the time he was 13, Johnny had the responsibility of caring for his family. 
and I loved them, so I, I, would, I tried to please them. The best way I could, because it would hurt their feelings if I didn't, you see. I used to travel alone a lot. I'd go out hunting beaver, I'd be gone two weeks to sometime two months in the spring. Mother never worried. Dad never worried. I knew I know to care to care myself. Johnny's hunting provided for the family, and he was so successful at it that when he was 19, he became a professional guide and outfitter. Father died in 1920, and, yeah, March 30th. The Spanish influenza, you, you probably read about that. It started in Europe, and it took a year to get over to New York, you know. Travel was slow after the First World War, and they killed more people than the war did. Two days before he died, he was there helping everybody across the river there, sawing the wood from Matthew Watson, packing the water from Matthew Watson. He was about the last one got, that got it, you know. Two days later, he just died. Just clogged up your lungs, that's what happened. He died in my arms, I was feeling my arms just died. My dad died when I was about three, three and a half years old. And from there on, well, I look at, I look at my brother as a, he was a brother and a father to me. Well, that was in the 1920s. See, I was already in business three years, see. So I had a lot of money. I, and I had my father buried proper and everything. Johnny's outfitting and guiding business grew until he was hiring relatives from as far away as Dawson. And then as a family deal, finally it spread out, so I was, boys from Dawson worked for me. And, and I had the biggest outfit in the Yukon then. And they were most successful. Oh, yeah. Didn't, didn't know one end of the horse and the other when I started, but uh, <clears throat> I watched people, you know, I learned from people. There's a fellow they, up here <coughs> named Ernie Butterfield. <coughs> he was from Michigan, and I learned a lot from him. He didn't teach me nothing, but I watched him, you know. People came from all over the world to hunt with Johnny. Internationally, he was proclaimed the best guide and outfitter in the world. There were some infamous as well as famous hunters among Johnny's clients. One German, Count von Stauffenberg, or Graf von Schirin, as he was also called, became disillusioned with the Nazi party in 1944 and tried to kill Hitler. This German Count was one or two that tried to bomb Hitler just before the war ended. At the oak table, it's what saved him. I planted a bomb in the briefcase, you know, under, under the oak table. The oak table knocked him out all right, but they shot him off. Johnny has always been able to move in one world while never losing the values of the other. At home, he was special too. Mark Wedge. Well, to me, I always looked at an uncle as a very successful person. He'd come off the hunts. There'd be lots of horses, and so you knew when you know, the hunts were over and it had a big influence on the whole town. He guided and outfitted hunters that came to the Yukon from southern Canada, Europe, and America to collect trophies, heads, antlers, and skins of wild animals. Since it's against native religion and traditions to waste, Johnny made sure the meat went back to the villages. He used to go out and hunt and bring in meat and stuff, and then he give it around the, the, the village, like, you know. Everybody gets something. Long time ago, people used to help each other. Hunting, trapping, and fishing have been a business as well as a way of life for the whole John's family. I thought we're women weren't supposed to do those things. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I rather I rather do all that work than 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 the housework. I rather be outdoors, going out and and hunting, fishing. To Johnny and his sisters, it's important to pass on their knowledge to the younger people. Mark, he quit his job and he went out and he stayed with me. 
And this is where he learned. We learn in school the three R's. It's called reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the traditional form of education are the three L's. You look, you listen, and you learn. And you need to balance the two. Well, I remember Mom teaching us how to hunt sheep. And she would say, well, you have to learn the habits of the sheep. You, know, you have to know what they're going to do. And once you learn what they're going to do, then you know what the wind's going to do, you know what their habits are, then you can you start hunting them because you know what they're going to do. And the thing that really struck me about it is that she was teaching me how to think like, you know, the process of thinking. And we don't learn that in school, how to think necessarily today. Like, you don't, can't take a course saying, this is thinking 101 or thinking 203. Are the young people proud of their culture? I think they should. I am. I'm glad I'm Indian. There's nothing wrong in it. No difference, only a little different color, that's all. In 1942, the American army invaded the Yukon. 12,000 troops. Overnight, they doubled the Yukon population. They came to build the Alaskan Highway. The Japanese had already bombed Pearl Harbor, and they held three islands in the Aleutians. The Americans feared a Japanese invasion of Alaska by air and by sea. They needed a supply route overland to Alaska through Canada, and they needed it quickly. They hired Indian guides to show them the way. One of those guides was Johnny Johns. I was the first man to hire up there. They show them where. <coughs> which were way to lay it out. I was uh, ahead of uh, 5,000 soldiers out there in the bush. Building the road wasn't easy. In winter, there was permafrost to deal with and bitter cold to live in. In summer, black flies, mosquitoes, and mud everywhere made life miserable for the soldiers. Oh, they like the country. Yeah, the, the, the Americans did. The, the colored people didn't like it. There was a lot of colored come up too, you know, soldiers. They were scared of these wild woods and they were fur, fur caps in the summertime, July when it's hot, <laughs> cold all the time. Johnny Johns was an expert guide for the U.S. engineers and army. He'd walked over most of the Yukon hunting and trapping. He knew where the swamps and the bogs were, where the land was solid. When you see a jack pine, you know it's on solid ground. They can't grow otherwise, he'd say. So you cut your road from jack to jack if you can. My boss was a, a uh, first lieutenant, and uh, he had all these instruments here, but, uh, and uh, you know rods and this and that and all that. And I said, don't need that. Leave it. It's too old to awkward to pack. <laughs> I said, no, don't need it at all. You got to cut a line first to use it. They're going to waste a lot of time. Johnny's horses were hired, too. I had 60 head of horses working on the Alaska Highway. There was money to make and a road to build, but the Americans had to be taught Canadian ways. Of course, uh, you had to train these uh, Americans, uh, soldiers, you know. They see a cabin there, not locked, and furs in there, and they stole the furs, you know. Trappers' cabins in the bush are never locked in case someone comes by needing shelter or food. Heavy furs, like bear hides, would be left in cabins all winter because they're too bulky to carry out by dog team. In summer, trappers would return and take the skins out by boat or canoe. They got them back, though, you know, the report in the, the offices of Tufts. The Army had tried to build the highway in a straight line. But a straight road is easier to bomb than a crooked one, so the orders were changed. Some Yukoners didn't understand the change, but Johnny took full advantage of it. Of course, a lot of people ask me why I made it crooked. Sometimes I headed for a little uh, beautiful lake. I used to like to want to fish in some day, and uh, put the Alaska Highway right by it, see. 
and so I could go there later on and fish. Of course, the Yukoners all said Johnny made it crooked because he was American soldiers kept him drunk, but uh, <laughs> that wasn't it. Johnny Johns died on February 19th, 1988, aged 89. I enjoyed every minute of my life, whatever I did. All my work, it didn't seem like work to me. Yeah, I did everything and enjoyed it all. <laughs> so that's the way it went, you know. <laughs> 